Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this installment of Boyce Thompson Institute's Breaking Ground discussion series. My name is AJ Bushy, and I'm in the communications department here at BTI. And for this month's Breaking Ground, we welcome BTI adjunct faculty member Rob Sharwood, a plant molecular biologist at Western Sydney University, who will talk with us today about using germplasm from seed banks and synthetic biology to build crops in, that can survive and thrive in challenging climates. Hi, Rob. Hi, AJ. Thank, thank you, you for, th very much for having me. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us today. I know it's pretty early in your day tomorrow <laughs> for, <laughs> yeah, for us, right. you out there in the future. And I guess uh, to kick things off, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, you know how you got into to plant science and your, your current position down there in Australia? Yeah, certainly. I'll just share a couple of slides just to um, illustrate a couple of things that I've been doing. Yeah. I'll just hide my... Hide that looks good. Sorry, mate, I just got to hide a panel. Okay. Yeah, so as, so as AJ has pointed out, um, I'm really interested in uh, building crops for the future and particularly underneath challenging climates. So um, if I could just get the next slide up. There we go. So this slide is a, a, a design about me and this is to um, from farming to science. So I was originally born in Bathurst um, in New South Wales, which, which is over the Blue Mountains from Sydney. So, um, and then from there, we had a farm at Trunky Creek, which was a half an hour south in, in, the, in the mountainous region that was primarily or formerly a, a gold mining town. And then we actually, um, my ancestors there were allotted a piece of land where we grew sheep for meat and fiber, um, cattle for beef, oats, and we grew winter wheat when it was first released. So that was a pretty interesting time. So I was getting exposed to new things, new challenges, new problems. And, and it wasn't until the millennial drought from 2001 and 2009 where I really saw what drought and heat waves can do to productivity of our farm and the impact that has on farming families. And that's what really um, spurned me on to um, become a scientist and to um, fortify farming incomes for the future. And, and that's what my journey has sort of started out. And, and uh, so we sold the farm in, during the millennial drought, which, which was uh, quite heartbreaking. And then from there, I decided to uh, do an undergraduate course in plant microbiology which consisted of a lot of human genetics. So I learned a lot about uh, human disease as well. So that was quite interesting. And then I did my postgraduate degrees at ANU as well in plant biochemistry and molecular biology. And then I did my first postdoc at the Boyce Thompson Institute with David Stern and where we looked at chloroplast gene regulation. And that was uh, a three years that um, I'll, nev I'll never forget and really set me on my career trajectory. Since then I've done um, some postdoctoral uh, re research at uh, Western Sydney University. Then I received an independent fellowship uh, to study at ANU. And then now I'm currently a senior lecturer at the Hawkesbury Institute for the Environment at Western Sydney University, where we look at um, above ground and below ground solutions um, to fortify agriculture for the future. And, um, and particularly coping with climate change. That's really a big mantra of our Institute. How are we going to deal with climate change, considering CO2 emissions aren't decreasing, which has really dramatic um, impacts on where we see changes in temperature and climates of which we grow our staple food crops. But one other thing I'd like to share, AJ, yeah. is sort of my passion for uh, out education outreach and the importance, um, the important role scientists have in, in, in outreach. So here we are. Um, in Timor Leste, in a place and where we were in the mountain region, very high up in Maliana, where we were teaching science teachers how to move towards um, inquiry based learning, where we give them um, experiments to illustrate scientific principles and, and, but with things around them. So they didn't have to go and get special things. We, so we designed a heap of um, experiments and, and, um, and we donated microscopes as well in addition to other donations for that. And, you know, it wasn't too in Atabai, which is in the bottom right photo, uh, where we're in a classroom that had no windows, no power. Um, 
big gaps between the classrooms so you could actually hear the te teacher next to you when we were teaching. And, and this was really honing our skills and understanding uh, what science can do to inspire people. So that's really uh, one of the things that really excites me about science is where you can take it. That's great, that's so important. And uh, today I believe is International Science Educators Day, I think, something oh, wow. like that. So that's, it seems appropriate. Yeah. Talk about this. Um, yeah, could you talk a little bit more about how climate change is impacting farming? Yeah, so um, I'll talk a little bit about in an Australian context because we have some data out of our Bureau of Meteorology that's um, quite worrying. But this also applies worldwide, and you'll see some examples of how it applies worldwide. And if you look at the NOAA website, you can actually see that. Even in the USA, there's definitely changes in, in temperature, which is going to impact agriculture, particularly um, as CO2 emissions, as I said before, aren't being abated at all. And so here's just the, a, a record of the frequency of extreme heat waves that's been happening in Australia. And this is um, when we reach a period of 35 degrees Celsius uh, for more than one day. And as you can see, the millennial drought was uh, uh, around the year 2000, 2001, and it went for nine years. So you can see in that period, we see an uptick massively of, of heat waves, which really impacted agriculture. And it, they were also exacerbated through drought conditions. So because there's no water in a profile for plants to be able to cope. So this sort of straight away said to me that we need to really think about uh, how we can get plants to cope with heat because we know that most of our crops are C3 crops and um, heat has a massive impact on yield of grain, for example, So, and um, which is pretty scary. Another scary title that, um, uh, well, newspaper article that came out back in May 22, um, when we looked at where India had a massive heat wave that curbed their, um, uh, their yields big time. And so what this meant, was that India actually bans its wheat exports because it needed it for itself. So, and this is what contributed to a massive price rise in wheat. Mm -hmm. So there's, there, there is big concerns about um, extreme weather events and how can we cope with this in the future. Another thing that Australia is renowned for is unpredictable rainfall patterns. And <laughs> so we've gone from uh, very little rain, rain, rainfall uh, to more recently, we've had massive floods and floods that I haven't seen before so since I've been around. So, um, but this was um, from the state of climate back in a few years ago. We said the major growing areas we can see um, in the south south east of Queensland and New South Wales mm. and um, the west the west coast as well. We saw that it was very much below average and lowest on record rainfall. So this was really de de detrimental. And, and, you know, when we talk to farmers and things, one of the things they, they would like to see is how can we accurately predict rainfall? And um, so that was an interesting conversation because it's, um, yeah, for me, I just look outside rather than relying on, <laughs> relying on forecasting because yeah. it's so hard yeah. um, when we do with that. And just to give you a bit more of a, uh, 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 more of an understanding about what heat does. So in terms of wheat, this is from the GRDC website, which funds a lot of uh, REIT research in Australia. Um, we, we see that there's been, when we have an increase in mean temperatures, um, mean temperatures across a season, we see that there's accelerated crop development. This means that there's, um, there's, there's, it develops quickly to flowering, but that hasn't got its um, carbohydrates laid down to make grain. So this is, um, affects the time to accumulate biomass and therefore yields gonna decrease. But what's really worrying for me is that um, heat stress uh, during grain filling can cause wheat losses up to a substantial amount of kilograms per hectare, 190 kilograms per hectare for every one degree rise in seasonal temperature. So um, we've already seen a one degrees rise in our average temperature in, in Australia, for example. So, so this is uh, quite alarming. Yeah, that seems like a really large loss. I, I, like I can't really kind of picture how much that is in my head, but it seems like a lot. Absolutely. And, um, and for one degree, it's not very, it's, it's only a small increment, which tells you how sort of we need to be looking at our germplasm to be more resilient to these heat events. 
And um, and in the end, it's what comes out of the header when when it goes through the, the, these crops, and they just either have reduced grain size or reduced numbers of grains, um, and the, or the quality of grain as well. So and and you know you don't want to put a lot of resources into making seed grain, uh, seed or or fodder if you're growing wheat because you want to get the premium price yeah. uh, for your bread wheat, for example. So yeah, it's quite alarming. And so we've also seen that, um, you know, Norman Borlaug, who's really an inspiration to plant scientists across the globe, where he actually improved harvest index in, in uh, wheat, rice and barley, and also was able to breed in disease resistance, really turned around crop productivity in marginal areas, um, particularly areas that had high disease rates. And, and so, but now, he focused mainly on har harvest index and disease, but for harvest index, we're now reaching a theoretical maximum. And so we need to break through this ceiling. And, <clears throat> and, um, and so that's, that's re really drives my research is how can we improve uh, the productive yield of mm -hmm. crops? And we need to search for, for new solutions. And this is you know, a combination of solutions. We need GMO solutions where we use genetic technologies and we need uh, breeding technologies as well. We need more avenues for for um, screening germplasm and, and things like that. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about some of the the more specifics of of what you're doing to use plant science to to help us combat yeah, these, sure. these challenges? Yeah. So I like to practice yield equation, and um, and so where we have yield that equals light interception times the radiation from the sun, or radiation use efficiency. Sorry and then times by harvest index. So harvest index can be defined as your grain yield over biomass. And this is where um, the dwarf wheats will really um, uh, mm. change this for normal borlaug because they're able to increase uh, the grain yield, but reduce the biomass. So therefore you get, and I did this by dwarf wheating, by, 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 by the dwarf wheat, sorry. And, um, and so, and from that, then we look at what are the components of this equation that we can make changes to. And we look at radiation use efficiency, which is also hugely important and because it impacts biomass. So, and so what we've been focusing on is photosynthesis. It's a key process. Um, David Stern has previously talked about this as well. And I sort of center a lot around Rubisco performance uh, to improve biomass production. So we can actually push yield up by improving biomass, that's productive. So we don't want biomass just sits there doing nothing. We want productive biomass that can actively transport through our growing wheat. And if we can improve uh, things like early vigor, not only in, in, in our food crops, but also cotton, for example, mm -hmm. um, particularly with heat, we're getting shorter crop durations, we can actually motor a bit faster to um, uh, create more carbohydrates for plant production. So this is, AJ, is a complicated slide, but I just uh, want to go through to, to some aspects of it about what is photosynthesis uh, for those who aren't so familiar with some of the processes, um, because I'm very fascinated by the, the biochemistry of photosynthesis and, and tweaking that. So that's where I sort of fit. So photosynthesis relies on two main things, sunlight and the diffusion of carbon dioxide into the, into the leaf cells. And so sunlight's crucial for making energy um, that's used by the Calvin Benson cycle to help um, that powers the synthesis of carbohydrates. And this is what is really crucial for yield and plant performance and growth and things like that. Yeah. And so there's um, a number of targets that have, that have been published recently, very nice work in Illinois um, and Essex about how we can improve um, aspects of the Calvin cycle, the light reactions. And then, well, where we fit is more in the Rubisco side of things because it's one of what we call nature's imperfections because it confuses itself between carbon dioxide and oxygen. And when you think about there's way more oxygen than carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, this is, this is a big problem. And plants invest a whole lot of nitrogen into making this protein or enzyme. And so, um, so that's why when we talk to our cotton farmers, they say, oh, why do we need so much nit nitrogen? It's because cotton produces so much rubisco mm. that it needs a lot of nitrogen. And you don't want yield penalties. If you decrease your rubisco content, less carbon assimilation, less yield. So 
it's a big problem. And there's other work by very nice work um, for the for the respiratory bypass also coming out of Illinois, um, based on um, previous work on the fatty respiratory bypass. And um, and so fatty respiration is a problem as well because we're losing carbon dioxide from the system. But we're more focused on tweaking Rubisco to make it um, more more um, improved. Right. So so what's your approach? How are you doing that? Are you just fiddling yeah, with so, it right off the bat? or, or what yeah, yeah, it's a big challenge, you know. What's really accelerated some of our our knowledge is understanding how proteins fold. Big data has been huge and things like that. So this is where I've designed my research program to look at how can we improve yield under future climates. You know, um, we want to improve carbon fixation and have collaborations with MBTI about how we can do this in in crops um, and C4 crops as well. Um, particularly looking at exploiting natural variation. So we look at um, a lot of um, germ, germplasm to see what is the variation of photosynthesis, but what drives that variation? Can we understand something from a climate of origin that's really hot and dry, how these plants survive to get new information? So we're always <clears throat> learning about things. And then what we also like to do is to collaborate with Alex Wu at the University of Queensland, where he has an excellent, robust model for determining um, if we make changes in photosynthesis, what would that translate to in terms of will we improve radiation use efficiency, which translates into changing yield. So um, it's nice to have a model being part of the program so that we can understand, is it really worth going down this way? You know, we have to justify to industry, is it worth, is the value proposition there um, for this? And then what's really important is what we learn from the field. So Glasshouse does not, um, equate to what's going on in the field. And so we try and um, make sure that we, um, we test things in the field because, you know, there's, there's so many other things going on. So in, in a nice glasshouse environment, we can show that there's, there's changes and this is going to improve, but then it needs to go to the field. So really what we focus on is exploiting natural variation in photosynthetic traits, where they use this in breeding programs um, to deploy or we actually use GMO approaches, depending on which crop we're working with. At the moment, GMO wheat is not really on the table um, because of its cost of regulation, and no one really wants to um, have GMO um, um, in their bread basket as, as yet. But there's going to be a time where um, it's going to have to happen if we want to have a, a sustainable supply of, of food, particularly through wheat, for example. You mentioned germplasm a few times. Could we? Could you explain what that is? And, and how <clears throat> yeah. So um, yeah. So if just before I describe some of my germplasm collections, what, some of the things we like to describe is um, how we screen photosynthetic performance, and this is where we grow things in the field and use um, a mobile and aerial platforms, and then we can go all the way down through to the genome to see what's making these changes. And we apply this to some of the germplasm that we've been very interested in. And, um, and what I'm mostly interested in is in the biochemistry. How can we make changes here? Mm -hmm. So some of the germplasm collections, and I'll put this sort of um, uh, uh, cheeky comment in about, um, is it a finite resource? You know, because there's only a certain amount of germplasm collections and we need to screen some of this. Is the trait space large enough in some of these collections? Because if you're only getting small changes that aren't going to contribute significantly, then you can't incorporate those into breeding programs. Mm. And so um, what's really interesting to me is the seed banks across the world. There's a, nowadays, there's more than 1,700 seed banks, which is quite amazing. And um, recently, I've come across this Eurisco um, um, uh, plant genetic resources which, which is really amazing it's and it's from across 400 institutions where they've started to to collate seed banks and what they have in in store and what's interesting is the global seed vault um so this is where things really that are really precious are stored and then um and then people can come and take things to regenerate later if, if they need need be and and so i read a story recently where someone had to go in and take their seed stocks um, uh, because of a, a, a huge event. And then they went, went once they built up the seed, they returned some 
So they definitely have their value and there's not enough invested into seed banks across the world. Yeah. But um, what I wanted to end with this part is that one, what's really interesting is the Vavlov Institute uh, f- uh, for Plant Industry. So this is um, located in St. Petersburg in Russia and it was one of the first seed banks in, uh, generated back in 1894. And Nikolai Vavlov yeah. is a Russian scientist who collected greater than 200,000 accessions because he understood the importance of preserving um, seeds for the future. And, and it's really sad because he actually died of starvation uh, towards the end of World War II, which is, mm. and, which is quite sad. And, and in addition to that, people understood the importance of seed banks back then and they actually protected um, the seed banks. And unfortunately, they also died of starvation. So we're very lucky to have access to this um, seed bank and, and, um, and maybe I might share a couple of things associated with what we've, what we've done. So um, we call it the Vavilov treasure chest because um, he's collected wheat seeds um, that haven't gone through breeding bottlenecks. And we call these um, types of bred wheats land races. So these are what farmers use traditionally in their own little micro environments. And so which suggests to me that there's nice adaptation going on there. And, and for some of them, we wonder why they were chosen because we could not get them to flower um, or, or they would lodge, which means that they fall over and we, we just, it'd be very hard to actually make um, food out of, out of some of these things. So it's quite interesting. And, and so these are just some of the, the, we grew them in the field a couple of times and this is just some of the, um, phenotypes we saw particularly with this darkening of the seed heads so which was quite amazing which I think we put it down to some anthocyanin and build up and and during senescence it turns into brown but um, yeah it's quite interesting mm-hmm. and so with this germplasm um, with collaboration with our colleagues at CSIRO and um, we looked at um, is there any photosynthetic diversity so the first thing we did we used that the Dave Kramer's multi-spec instrument which we can rapidly screen hundreds of plants and this is so we can look at linear electron flow and this tells us about how efficient plants utilize light and so we had commercial checks that are labeled here in this graph as check and then we looked at um, linear electron flow and we could see that there was some diversity in linear electron flow in the Vavilov collection so a higher linear electron flow means there will be more energy to make carbohydrates available. So that was why that was why we were screening them. And then we looked at this SPAD as well. And SPAD is, just gives you a chlorophyll A fluorescence, which tells you about the nitrogen content of the leaves. So high nitrogen content means the plants are packing lots of nitrogen into the photosynthetic apparatus. And so we, this was in, crucial for us to understand what was going on. So could you have higher electron transport uh, to make energy for the Calvin cycle, but less nitrogen? Because that would be a bonus. And so, um, so we showed some of this data in this recent paper as well. But That's because I, I focus on carbon assimilation, I'm pretty excited about screening for what's going on. And BC max is a term we use for maximum carbon assimilation. So this is dictated by Rubisco. And we screened these, uh, the Vavilov lines and the commercial checks. So we had at least, I think it was five commercial checks um, in this data set. Um, four, four commercial checks of different genetic backgrounds. And so we wanted to see how the Vavilov was lined up. And what we initially saw um, was some great diversity in VCMAX. So we could actually probe this. Is it Rubisco amount or is it its catalytic rate that's making these changes? And we're still on, in, this is still under investigation. Okay. And again, um, we looked at electron transport, which we denote J here. And, and again, as diversity. So this is the real value of, of diverse germplasm, AJ. And this is um, what's important to us to understand how this diversity occurs. Yeah, that's really fascinating. How some, uh, they're better at taking in the light, but they, they're not making more nitrogen they're not fixing or i guess you know fixing as much carbon so they're i would, I would guess that that means the rubisco is not as efficient yeah that's right yeah that's right yeah it's um it's it, it's quite interesting yeah. or yeah or or there's other ways to um to get efficiency in the light reactions as well so that tells us that um 
you know, there is opportunities for altering carbon assimilation, but maybe not so much for electron transport. Yeah. So we, you mentioned uh, synthetic biology earlier. How is that fitting into to all the stuff? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in terms of synthetic biology, um, you know, we see a lot of the design test learn modules about how we design things and things. So what we do is that we've been mining natural genetic variation and mining big data to identify opportunities. We need, um, once we have these genes, we need the ways to test these. And what's been really big recently is the Rubisco and Nicola work from manager at Haya Harkland's lab and Robbie Wilson. And more recently uh, from Spencer Whitney's lab where they've shown that we can do plant rubisco in E. coli and mm. then alter it and mm. make changes and we can test it. So the big thing with synthetic biology is that we have a platform to test our genes. And so there's now we're developing plant platforms to test um, rapidly more things because as we can do Golden Gate uh, things, which means that we can do lots of genes in the one construct, we can do certain testing there's protoplasts and things like that. And then we simulate our changes in a crop model response uh, for, tra for our trade testing. So, um, you know, we have a, this great model developed by Alex Wu and we can, you know, change what's going underneath in the biochemistry of, of photosynthesis. And then we can simulate what it's going to be. And then we learn from this. This is the real crucial part is learning. And, um, and so, and, but what we have changed for us, we've changed this design test learn cycle a little bit as well, because we actually take off genes for germplasm development, whether it be a GMO approach or giving certain germplasm to say, hey, this has your traits you need, this would be a good um, plant to cross. But however, you know, if it depends on how, how um, diverse your germplasm is, if you've got something that's really diverse, you're gonna have to end up doing a GMO approach because um you know just so much genetic drag that you'll bring unwanted genes with you um and things like that so so this enables us to create artificial variation aj and and we're working on this as well um and um on how we go okay we're getting about 4 30. um i don't see any questions in the in the chat box yet so if folks have any questions um please feel free to throw them in there uh, I do have one last question for you, Rob. Um, yeah. You mentioned uh, C4 plants earlier. Uh, what 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 are C4 plants, and and what are you doing with them? Yeah. Thanks, AJ. So, yeah. So we look at C4 photosynthesis because it's one of the best examples of convergent evolution that we know. There's more than I think Rowan Sage. I think he said there's more than eighty independent. Um, pathways of evolution of C4 photosynthesis. And this wow. is where we have plants that have biochemical and anatomical changes to separate two carboxylates. So we separate PEPC, which is phosphoenopyruvate carboxylase from rubisco. And rubisco is mainly in the bundle sheaf cell where it fixes um, um, carbon dioxide. Whereas PEPC um, in the C4 pathway we have CO2 that's, that does, that is um, enters the leaf and is hydrated to bicarbonate, and PEPC fixes bicarbonate to make this four-carbon compound, and uh, um, its name is oxaloacetate, and that's converted to malate, which goes through to the bundle sheath, which is decarboxylated, and this bundle sheath is um, resistant to CO2 leaking, and so mm. what that means is that CO2 can go really high, and rubisco can operate at its maximum. Right. We right. focus on PEPC because it influences the initial part of carbon assimilation in C4 plants, and it also influences uh, water use efficiency. So if we can effectively fix this bicarbonate, um, we can actually fix more carbon per unit of water, and so making it more water use efficient. So, so C4 plants do have opportunities to improve their productivity as well. Mm -hmm. Why we focus on PEPC? Well, again, PEPC um, is really important because it supplies uh, the CO2 to the concentrating mechanism of C4 photosynthesis. And we know that climate change and heat waves and drought impact CO2 diffusion in, inside the leaf. And so we're looking at ways to make PEPC more resilient to um, um, uh, low CO2 conditions and also heat. And this affects um, 
food production in the RC4 crops such as sorghum and maize. So this is a complicated slide. Just, I just wanted to show you that PEPC is very highly regulated. It's um, an interesting protein. It's a very large protein compared to other plant proteins that we study. Um, and it has double the sequence space of rubisco. So it's very, very complex to, to work out what, what um, mutations we can do with it. But so what we've done is um, we've screened a lot of, uh, of our native grasses here in Australia for changes in PEPC sequence. And, you know, again, this is going back to big data, going through um, sequence alignments and things like that. And what does it mean? And then, uh, then cross-referencing this with our biochemistry knowledge. And we found some interesting changes across the subtypes of, of panicums uh, within Australia. And what's particular of interest is that we found this deletion that only existed in this particular types of panicum speed grass species. And we thought, well, what's going on here? We've never seen this before. And it seems only to be with this subtype. And so we did some um, kinetics on this. And if we look at in the, in the red boxes here, we noticed that Eurochloropenicordis, which is the PCK, has a lot faster turnover speed. Well, thought, wow, this, this is interesting. And we also found that um, it, it was very resistant to malate inhibition in the presence of an activator it has. And we thought, wow, this is really exciting. So this is potentially um, going, to, going to really impact um, uh, other Pepsi, uh, other C4 plants that don't have this type of Pepsi. So now we're looking into how we can get this into plants and actually using synthetic biology to do directed evolution on this particular Pepsi so we can actually get new isoforms that would be better suited. And so, you know, again, we talk, we come back to synthetic biology and this is where I'll end up, is that um, now designing plant platforms. So one of our biggest challenges um, is plant transformation. And it's really great um, that we have Joyce Van Eck working on lots of plant transformation strategies, which is really crucial because you know, we can have all this synthetic biology, but if we can't get it into plants, particularly our key crops, then um, we're, we're, we're left with breeding. And so, and some of this can take a long time. So some of the breeding um, pathways for wheat can be up to five years to seven years to get a new trait, depending on if you use speed breeding or within cotton, it's generally a GMO approach, but still then we can't do elite germplasm, which means that, you know, you're seven years before you're getting a product that could be tested in the field. So that's a long time, considering seven years is, is big in terms of how our climate is changing. So we need to act now, I guess is my message, and we have the tools coming on board. And I think we need to work um, really carefully about expanding our repertoire of what plants we can transform our foreign genes into. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and and so we'll, we'll have this um, Ceteria viridis plant where we can have Pepsi knocked out and then we can go back in and replace it with new Pepsi so we can get real implanted testing, not modeling. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, okay, so I still don't see any uh, questions. If folks have questions, you can throw them in the chat box. Um, I'll, I'll kick this off though. Um, how, so when, when, it, when to, just to bring it back around, um, you know, to, to making crops be able to survive or have higher yield in this era of, of climate change is the idea is just, you know, to, to make it grow faster, to have, you know, higher carbon yield and crank up the, the photosynthesis so that it can do it before anything bad happens, like before it gets flooded out or before there's a drought, or is there something else going on that will, that will make it drought resistant? Or, or flood resistant and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, so there's many pathways to alter plants. You know, there's, there's plenty of work out there where people are looking at drought tolerance um, with how stomata will function as well and, and how quickly stomates can open and close because they're the gateway for CO2 to enter the leaf. Mm -hmm. We focus on um, improving the efficiency of rubisco because when we start to get stomata closure, CO2 starts to decline quite rap rapidly in the mesophyll cell and C3s and, and therefore rubisco will start to deactivate on you. And, and so we need to sort of uh, make it more efficient at capturing CO2. 
which is what C4 plants did in, in the beginning. And, um, and the other thing is heat tolerance. So well, we want to make it heat tolerant. So if you get a heat wave, you're not going to get a yield penalty. That's the goal. That's the ultimate goal. Can we reduce the yield penalty from getting a heat wave? Um, obviously, if you get a heat wave when you've got your, your pollen being produced, um, it's going to be um, highly unlikely that you're going to get any seed. But we're looking at other times when you get heat waves throughout that time. And I guess you made an excellent point, AJ, about early vigor, which is about making things grow faster, but it's, but making sure it has the engine to to have the early vigor, um, so we can get crops established quickly. People um, artificially doing similar things in terms of planting a bit earlier as well. So taking the gamble that they might not get a frost um, like they should like they should um, previously were getting. And, um, and so they will plant a little bit earlier um, to make sure they get the full growth season in. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Khalid. Is there any plant without chlorophyll? If yes, how do such plants survive? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a great question. I yeah. actually have never come across a plant without chlorophyll. So the, the light and dark reactions of photosynthesis is critical to life on earth. So I haven't, um, you know, we know when a plant that doesn't have chlorophyll because it's chlorotic and it, and it can't assimilate carbon. So, um, yeah, so. You know, I, I got to chime in here. We do have some around here in, in New York uh, that, are, that are parasitic, I believe. I think, um, I, right, I don't right. know, the, the common name was, was Indian pipes. I don't know if they're still called that. Um, I don't know if that's, if that's a, a, a PC name. Uh, these days, but that's what that's what we used to call them when they were white and they're gorgeous. They're absolutely beautiful plants. Wow, they, wow. Uh, uh, I think they were usually around around beech trees. Something weird, like they. Uh, I don't remember. Maybe I'll I'll look it up. If we get another question, I'll look it up real quick. Yeah, the parasitic plants is an interesting one because they can get their carbon source. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's see, any other questions out there? Or I got time to. Ghost plant, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I've heard of resurrection plants, so where they completely dry out um, to, to 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 absolutely nothing, and then when they get a bit of rainfall, they spring back alive. Yeah, I'll put the. This is Monotropa uniflora. I'll just throw them oh, thank there. Thank you. So you you, you can re research that, but it's they're pretty cool. Um, I've only seen them in, in the woods a couple of times. Um, we have another yeah, question. Wow. Uh, hi, Rob, exciting stuff. This is from our own Feiwei Lee. Hi, Feiwei. Uh, would love to chat with you sometime about pyranoids and Pepsi more. It's more of a- Absolutely, Feiwei. Yeah, he, you know, he's he's doing a lot of stuff on uh, canned plants and, and uh, some C4 plants. Oh, excellent, yeah, yeah. When uh, when could we expect your next your next big paper? Is there anything, uh, anything <laughs> in the works? Is that is that not a good question to ask? <laughs> no. So we've just got funding for our Pepsi project to continue it. So um, um, so that's pretty exciting. So um, yes. hopefully we can work on some of those things towards the end of this year, um, where we're actually doing some directed evolution on Pepsi. So because um, mm. we can make pepsi dependent nicola now so yeah directed evolution is pretty interesting stuff could you talk a little bit more about that and I, I don't i don't recall you hitting that too much no so yeah so it's um it's been the tool has been around for a while in various forms and um but it's now becoming more important for us now now we can um artificially create variation in in, in sequence space so um, the sequence space of, of uh, Morbisco, I think, is about 700 base, bases, 1,700 bases. I think it's 1,700 bases. And, um, yeah, that's right. And then, so, you know, if it's, um, it's very hard to sort of, um, it's very hard to sort of survey all those different codons to see what changes the amino acid and what, the, what, what is its catalytic phenotype. So we can do, for example, directed 
um, evolution through Aeropro and PCA, where you make subtle changes to the sequence and then you put it into a E. coli system and, and that um, would de be dependent on how good that rubisco is. So it would, the, the colony size would translate to um, how, how good its rubisco is going depending on how you grow your plates and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, that's why I mentioned that is our germplasm a finite resource because, you know, with, with phenotyping coming to the fore now, we can screen lots and lots of plants very fast and we can get a pretty good handle quickly on trait space. So, you know, I've gone through some germplasm where there is no trait space or very little trait space in photosynthetic processes. And so that means we have to go wider. We need to go to relatives and, you know, we're doing that in cotton now where we're looking at wild relatives and it can only be a GMO approach. So, mm -hmm. and then once we do that, then we can create new variations by doing artificial or uh, directed evolution. So, um, so we can do testing of sequence space a lot faster than what nature can do actually. Yeah, that's cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, so we have another one from Fairway. Uh, who has found evidence that bacteria type Pepsi is involved in an aquatic cam. Are you planning to look into this different type of Pepsi? Yeah, so um, we're familiar with some of the bacterial Pepsis, but we're interested in ones that were from bacteria and other organisms that can grow at high temperatures. And so we, we, we thought we found one that was going to be really strong at a high temperature because it has it it had um, it can grow up to seventy degrees in this near this thermal vent or something, and when we when we put it in E. coli, we couldn't get any activity out of it because we couldn't get above forty degrees. So, mm. <laughs> so we thought, okay, that Pepsi isoform is not one to follow up. <laughs> but yeah, no, we're not. We don't have any plans. We look at um, um, different Pepsis for how they inhibited. So their product inhibited um, and other metabolites inhibit them. And so this is one of the big things in C4 evolution is that um, this um, malate inhibition of Pepsi. So we want to try and relax that a little bit to get more CO2 pumping towards Rubisco and not turning Pepsi down or tuning it down in activity. So um, that's one thing we look for. So yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions out there? I think we might be winding down. Rob, oh, we got another one uh, from Riley. Is there any impact on Pepsi activity when the tetramer is different? For example, if one of the four tetramer subunits is an engineered Pepsi and the other three are native Pepsis? That's a question. Yeah. That, that that's a, a very good question and hopefully i can answer that more in depth towards the end of the year when we actually have some of these de de different um, te um different tetramers but um one of the first things we're interested in is does going from diamond to tetramer impact activity and um, what does that mean if then if you have a foreign tetramer or things like that so um mm. yeah so from what what i can say is is that um we're definitely looking into this and to see if they are compatible um, as well. So, um, yeah. But this is but one of the reasons why we knock out Pepsi and Ceteria completely is because we want to see the performance, particularly of our um, full Tetramer. And because we know very little uh, about the interactions of, of different Pepsis together. So that would, yeah. So the first step is to, is to create a completely homologous Pepsi. So is Pepsi four separate peptides forming a tetramer? So yeah, it forms a, a it's actually, it's one peptide that um, forms in, into uh, a dimer, and then it forms into a homo tetramer. So, uh -huh. okay. um, so it's four identical um, isoforms data together. But, you know, we do have plants where we express another Pepsi that would make it a hybrid one. And, um, but we're still yet, it's, it's, it's kind of tricky to then work out what, um, is, it, is it just its own tetramer yeah. uh, within the plant or is it forming the hybrid tetramer? And, and to do that, you need very specific antibodies, which is hard 
which is hard to do for PAPC. And perhaps there's a proteomic approach where we can determine if it's, or a structural approach, um, if, it, if the hybrid, if it is in fact a hybrid. So that's the tricky part. Yeah, I was going to ask, is, I mean, it sounds like that would be tricky <laughs> yeah. to make sure it's actually a hybrid there. That's right. So we'll take our first steps in making it its full self because we don't know. As I said before, the sequence space is large. There are certain interaction loops um, that may affect activity and we don't know about. And, um, and so, you know, we've got recent data uh, from single angle X-ray um, scattering that um, when we incubate it with G6P, we actually get this big conformational change. And you think, wow, if we had a hybrid, what would that do? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot here that we're following up. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, what opportunities are there to improve Rubisco's specificity? Well, I guess that's to, so, so it'll only use carbon dioxide instead of oxygen. I'm guessing that's the question. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So specificity is, is, um, is how well it fixes CO2 as opposed to oxygen. And so, um, yeah, and so it's quite a tricky one to actually um, improve because there, there, is some, um, a, there is some trends out there when you increase specificity, you decrease the speed, but they're just trends. So um, there, is, there, is, there is examples of where you increase specificity and, and its turnover rate stays the same. So the, the biggest opportunity that I see is looking at red algae because red algae um, has a specificity of 160, which is double that of higher plant. So, and, and so, so that, um, but how they actually achieve that has been under investigation for a long time. And, you know, I've always been telling uh, the Rubisco uh, direct, director of direct evolution people, you guys should be doing gene shuffling where we get, the, the the large and small subunit genes out of red algae and shuffle them into um, higher plant to see if we can get anything. But the problem is all you need is one amino acid that is not liked by the folding machinery of plants and then it just falls out of solution. So yeah. it is um, a very complex problem, but but also at the same time, I would say it is the holy grail. If we, could imp if we knew, understood how specificity um, could go greater than um, 100 in, in, in plants um, and, and things like that. So yeah, understanding that is, is complicated because we know that Bob Spritzer has raised Clemmy Rubisco um, specificity to the, um, from um, I think it's around the 55 up to 70, I think it was, uh, which is close to the higher plant by just doing hybrid small subunits, but um, we never exceeded that. So yeah. I wonder why why red algae do you think have evolved that ability? Is it something just about being in the ocean? Like, are there different concentrations of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the ocean that might kind of force it to do that? Or what what do you think? Yeah, that's a great question, AJ. We, that still puzzles me, actually. Yeah. So I I guess the safest way to say is we don't know um, why algae have this. We know the diversity is there. That's quite high. They actually have, so unlike green rubiscos, the red rubiscos from red algae, they actually have broken some catalytic trade-offs that we talk about in terms of if you increase speed, you, you decrease affinity. Mm. But they've broken that. And it's hard to understand um, how these shifts in kinetic parameters have, have been influenced. And again, you know, we the technology for us is not there yet, particularly NMR, for example, to maybe study some of these interactions, particularly with how the intermediates of the active site go ahead. So we just published um, this early this year, um, yeah, in January, um, our paper with Murray Badger, where we looked at um, uh, the carbamylation properties of Rubisco, and maybe that might have an influence. And so um, have a look at, I encourage everyone to have a look at that paper because it was one of my, most exciting papers where we actually think about the true enzymatic mechanism and what is changing rather than screening lots of rubiscos yeah. we need to really tunnel in to look at because it has a it has five partial reactions from fixing carbon dioxide to getting two molecules of phosphoglycerate wow. and those five partial reactions 
um, they're hard to track. Um, you know, so we need to, yeah, we need, we need to um, learn lots more about this, but it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what about um, in the in the light reactions? I've always wondered about this because um, a lot of, so you have the, the light hits chlorophyll, right? And it excites an electron and the electron gets passed out the Z diagram. I remember yep, that yep. from Intro Botany Forever Absolutely. Ago. Um, but a lot of that gets gets wasted as heat, right? So it doesn't doesn't don't a lot of that energy from the photons get weight. Is there a way to make that process more efficient? Yeah, so I think yeah, so we also lose a bit in fluorescence as well and heat. That's a good question. I think that's um a, a little bit outside of what we study, but we there are researchers here in Sydney where they look at different versions of chlorophyll to fix different wavelengths of light that we previously don't haven't appreciated like chlorophyll f was recently discovered that goes a bit more into the far red which means we can fix more um um huh. light or yeah fix more light, i shouldn't say fix more light um intercept more light at a different yeah. wavelength to power photosynthesis so it's um it, it's it's uh yeah a tricky one but I think what we've been looking at is the flux for cytochrome B6F. So, and um, and because its complex is tightly tightly regulated, and then it's been shown in C4, if you increase its abundance, you you get more electron flow through. So that's some of the things we've been looking at, but not necessarily the the loss of heat. So it, yes, I think what you're getting to is the efficiency um, is definitely room for improvement. Um, is a diversity in photosystem too, and and how it uh, splits water and that I'm, I'm not too sure because it's so conserved so you'd have to find something that's mm -hmm. that's uh, been really adapted in a certain place um, for a long period of time um, yeah whether there are other more novel chlorophylls out there um, yeah but I guess there's people studying this to to improve the efficiency all right very cool and uh, one last question uh, do you recruit graduate students to do these amazing works with you? And how can someone access <laughs> yeah. such opportunity if there is? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so basically at the moment we have we have three graduate um, students in the lab, which um, very integral and and a postdoc as well. So our graduates, um, uh, the team is 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 building, and um, yeah, so there's opportunities. Just just email me if you would like to apply. There's opportunities coming up. Um, I think there's a position closing um, on the 31st of the 1st, and we may have another opening um, in the next month or so as well in the group for, for HDR. Oh, sorry, PhD students. Would it be all right if I popped your email address in the chat box for people to reach Absolutely, you? totally fine. All right, let's see if this works. Would you like me? To, I don't think I can do it. Oh, I think I... Yeah. There we go. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, so if anyone's interested to, to come and do some work with us, whether it be postdocing or um, PhD, just get in touch and um, we can look at preparing grants together. And, and um, but there's always opportunities for PhD students to apply to, to come and work with us. Great. I think that's a good note to end on. <laughs> Thank you, AJ. We're getting right up to the top of the hour. Thank you again. Dr. Rob Sharwood for taking the time to today to, to chat with us. And thank you all of you out there for joining us today and asking some awesome questions. Thanks again, Rob. Thank you all out there for joining us today. And please join us for BTI's next Breaking Ground discussion series with Dr. Miguel Pineros. He was a plant physiologist with the USDA right, right across the street over here at the Holly Center. And he's also an adjunct faculty member here at BTI. And that will be on Tuesday, February 28th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard. So we'll be back to our, our noon Ithaca time. And uh, that's going to be really neat. Um, you should definitely come check it out. He's uh, like an electrophysicist, and he does some really cool stuff measuring electric currents and in individual plant cells. So really, really neat stuff. Um, so I, I encourage you to join us next month. And uh, you can also, you can go to btiscience.org, which I put there in the chat box for more information and to register. And you can also see replays of all 29 of our previous breaking grounds on our website at btiscience.org 
slash breaking dash ground dash discussion dash series. And this is number 30. Congratulations, Rob. You're our, you're our 30th guest. I feel like that's a, a good number. Awesome. Absolutely. It's a good number. <laughs> and you can read more about BTI's current research and many other neat stories about BTI science in our annual report, which you can find online at btiscience.org slash annual report. And uh, just a reminder, BTI is an independent uh, nonprofit research institute, and we operate largely in, in thanks of uh, support of, of uh, generosity of community members like you. And if you'd like to make a gift to support BTI, you can donate online at btiscience.org slash give or email our development team at development at btiscience.org. And thank you all again for your interest and support of Boyce Thompson Institute. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, wonderful evening, and please be well. <laughs>